Chapter 11, video one. We are back to hypothesis testing for means this time around. So according to Nabisco, the average weight of an Oreo cookie is 11.3 grams. A consumer watchdog group has received numerous complaints from angry Oreo customers who claim Oreos are smaller than they used to be. The group randomly selects 30 Oreos from a large container of Oreos to calculate a sample mean weight of 11.19 grams and a sample standard deviation of 0.0817 grams. Is there convincing evidence that Oreos weigh less than 11.3 grams now? So in order to do our hypothesis or significance testing, we're going to follow the same four steps that we did two chapters ago when we did this for proportions. We're going to write out our hypotheses, we're going to check our conditions, we're going to perform our calculations, and we are going to finish with our conclusion statement. So first, in general, the hypotheses. Uh, this time around, it is for means, and we're always going to be hypothesizing about the population mean, and in this video, for just one sample. So we are hypothesizing about the population mean. In future videos, we'll talk about two sample problems where we'll be looking at the difference of means, or the difference of mu's. Um, and then in the third video, we will be discussing the mean difference for a paired data set, just like we did last chapter. So our null hypothesis for a one sample problem is gonna be that mu is equal to some claimed value versus alternatively that mu is one of three possibilities, either gonna be greater than, less than, or not equal to that same claimed value. And like always, we need to define in context what does our parameter mu represent here. It represents the mean what specifically. So in our Oreo example, the null hypothesis is that mu is equal to the claimed 11.3 grams. And what we want to prove that is true is that the true mean is now less than 11.3 grams, where mu is our mean weight of an Oreo. Now for the conditions, these are the same three conditions that we checked last chapter. So number one, random. We need to be on the lookout for a random sample, an SRS, or something involving random assignment. There's gotta be some aspect of randomization. And in our problem, it said specifically that they were gonna randomly select 30 Oreos. So the random condition has been verified. Now the independent or the 10% rule, when our sample involves volunteers with random assignment, which is not the scenario in this problem, then we don't technically need to check the independent condition. Uh, but again, we did randomly select these Oreos from a population, so we do need to check the independent condition. And is the population at least 10 times our sample size? So who or what is the population? The population is all Oreos from the large container. May I assume that there are more than 300 Oreos that are in this large container? Well, since they used the adjective large, it's making me believe that this will be safely assumed to be true. So we don't know for sure if this is 100% true, so we will just write out assume true. Now, the normal condition is going to allow us to calculate that p-value. Uh, and we're going to use a different calculator command this time around. We're not going to use normal CDF like we did with proportions. We're going to have to use its T distribution cousin, T CDF. Now, there were three situations like we discussed last chapter, and it's the same three that we are going to discuss this chapter. And I always kind of look at these in this specific order. First, if the population just happens to be given to you as normal or approximately normal, then all you have to state is the sampling distribution is approximately normal because the population distribution is also normal or approximately normal. Now, it's not going to be often that they're going to tell you this information, but when it does happen, it's a really easy check. Now, the backup to number one, is if we have a big enough sample size, then we can use the central limit theorem. So our large sample size was at least 30. Um, I've been saying 25 and up is still probably acceptable, but we're really looking for that 30 and higher. 
So if we have that big sample size, then we're going to write the sampling distribution is approximately normal because of the central limit theorem with the large n, with the large sample size. And you don't have to specify how large is large enough. You just need to know in the back of your mind that large is typically 30 or more, or we could even say 25 or more if we're in that ballpark. So the third check, and this is our newer check that we used last chapter, and that's if the population distribution is not known to be normal, and if we don't have a big enough sample size, then what on earth can we do? At that point, we need to look at a graph, typically a box plot is what we explored, of our data to check for strong skewness or outliers. And remember, how strong is too strong is kind of up to you to make that determination. Uh, if you feel like they really want you to do the whole problem, then there's a good chance that the skewness isn't strong enough for them. Uh, but it's really, really got to look, I mean, like crazy, crazy, crazy strong. Like maybe something like this, where again, you just kind of look at the minimum, the maximum, and the median. And if you feel like the difference between the median and the minimum is far different than the median to the maximum, and it could go in the other direction of the skewness, uh, then you might just want to call it out as it being too strongly skewed in order for the normal condition to be verified. Now, if you have outliers, that is game over right there. You have outliers, no go. We may not do this. But you always have to first check, uh, do you have a big enough sample size for the central limit theorem? Because even if there are outliers present, the central limit theorem kind of washes over the fact that there are outliers because you have that large sample size. Now, if neither strong skewness or outliers are present, then we get to state the sampling distribution is approximately normal because the data or the graph shows no strong skewness or outliers. And you must include a sketch of the graph or the box plot. Uh, as proof of this. You can't just state it and then move on. You have to state it and then prove that there really is no strong skewness or outliers based upon the picture that you see on your calculator. So just roughly sketch the best of your ability what that box plot looks like. Now for our Oreo problem here, we get to stop at option two. The sampling distribution is approximately normal because of the central limit theorem with our large sample size of 30. So we didn't even need to look at a box plot of our data. And there's also an issue with this. We weren't given the data. We were just told about the statistics from the data. So even if we had to look at a box plot, we would need to request the actual data from those 30 Oreos. Now, in terms of the calculations, on the AP Stats formula sheet, you really don't get very much useful information here besides just the generic statistic minus parameter over the standard error. Now, the standard error of the statistic, this is something that I would provide you on the chapter test because you also get this on the official AP Stats formula sheet. And that standard error of the statistic is always the kind of the standard deviation aspect um, of the formula itself. And I'll give you the one sample and the two sample scenario. So we have t, our t distribution, will be equal to x bar minus mu, and that mu is going to be our hypothesized mu value. And so for our Oreo example, that'll be our 11.3. Now, once we get that t test statistic, not only did we need to provide what this value was, but we also then needed to convert it into a p-value. So if our test statistic was positive, you know, something, 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 something. Then we would do uh, the probability that we would find other T test statistics that are greater than or equal to that positive test statistic. But if our test statistic was negative, something, 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 then we would go less than or equal to in that scenario. And that's what kind of guides us to know for sure what is the lower bound and the upper bound. So if we had a negative test statistic, then we would go negative infinity to that negative test statistic. But if we had a positive test statistic, then we would start at that positive value and shoot up to positive infinity. Now, the degrees of freedom are going to be the same as they were last chapter when we did confidence intervals. For a one sample, it's just the sample size minus one. And you do need to label what those degrees of freedom are. 
Once we get that, then we will have our p-value. But consider this. This is right now a one-sided p-value. There might be times where we need to double this p-value if we are dealing with a two-sided test. How do we know if we're dealing with a two-sided test? We'll go back and look at your alternate hypothesis. In our example, we don't have a two-sided test because our alternate was that mu was less than 11.3. But if we just felt like in general the mean was no longer 11.3, if it was mu not equal to 11.3, then we would take that p-value and double it because technically we need to be looking at both tail ends of our t-distribution. Now, it is super important that when you do this by hand, that you must identify not only the p-value, because obviously that's the important component that's going to allow us to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis, but you also need to provide the test statistic. Now with our calculator, the proper name of the procedure is a one sample t-test for mu or for a mean. Uh, in our stat over to test options, we are right at option number two, a T test. Now, number one is a Z test. And I'm not really going to make a big emphasis on Z versus T in this chapter because we rarely, 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 rarely saw the use of using a Z interval in the last chapter. But if they give us the population standard deviation, then we can use a Z test or a two samp Z test. Now the mu sub zero here, this is our hypothesized value. X bar SX. Um, now this is under the assumption that we only have the statistics available to us and not the actual data because that's what's happening in our Oreo problem. We were given the statistics. So we would type in what the sample mean and the sample standard deviation were. We would also type in what our sample size is, and then we would need to select the appropriate alternate hypothesis and then select calculate. Now, if we were actually given data, then we would want to select the data option and then tell the calculator what list our data was located in. Now, for our Oreo problem, I'm going to show you what this looks like with the formula. And if you want to use the formula, you have to write out the full formula with the variables involved or we could name the proper procedure as a one sample t-test for mu. So using our t-distribution formula here, what's this look like? So this is t equals the sample mean weight from earlier was 11.19. Our hypothesized value was 11.3. So we want all of that. So I'm going to put parentheses around that, especially when I go to type this in my calculator, divided by the quantity S, which was given as 0 0.0817, divided by the square root of our sample size of 30. Now, if I were to type that into my calculator, I actually get a very, very small t test statistic. We are seven standard deviations away from where we would expect to be. And typically, we only really talked about you know, 0, 1, 2 to 3 standard deviations away. But this is a lot. This is saying 11.19 is a very rare sample mean value to get out of 30 Oreos when we were expecting something more along the lines of 11.3. So now if I want to convert this test statistic into a p-value, then I would find the probability of other t test statistics. And since this is negative, then I'm going to go less than or equal to this negative 7.374. And so now I get to use a new calculator command that I haven't gotten to use before. I get to use tcdf instead of normal cdf. Now tcdf is just a couple commands below normal cdf when you hit second and variables to get to your distributions. And it works pretty much the same way as normal cdf except it needs degrees of freedom. So the lower bound in this scenario is negative infinity. And we're going to go up to negative 7.374 as our upper bound. And then degrees of freedom, we said was going to be sample size minus one. So sample size of 30 minus one gives us 29 degrees of freedom. So that is going to give me what the p value comes out to be. And I get 1.99 to four significant digits. But the thing that some of you guys aren't quite catching on to is 
This is an impossible p-value. You can't have a probability value of over 100%. And this is basically saying 199.9%. What you typically need to notice is there's some other value at the end of this. And there is an e negative 8 at the end, which means times 10 to the negative 8th power. So if you see a number that is above 1, it is, yeah, yeah, above one. Then look at the very end, because there's a good chance that this is a scientific notation value. So we have a extremely, extremely small p-value in this situation. Now, if I were to use my calculator and use that t-test command, then I would need to properly name the procedure, a one sample t-test from you, uh, go to stat, over to test, select option two, and again, we knew what the statistics were. We didn't know what the data was. So I type in the 11.3 hypothesized mean, my 11.19 sample mean, my 0 .0817 sample standard deviation, sample size of 30, and then I want my alternate to be this middle option, that it's going to be less than the claimed value of 11.3. So it's kind of like saying mu is less than the hypothesized 11.3. And then I want to go to calculate. And you can see, I get that same test statistic. I get that same very small p-value. Now, the other three things down here were things that I already had typed into the calculator. So there's no real need to write those values down. But you definitely need the test statistic and the p-value. So now, we are at the conclusion part of this. If the p-value is less than the alpha value, then we are going to reject the null hypothesis. But if the p-value is not less than or is greater than the alpha value, then we will fail to reject the null hypothesis. Now, you do need to have this written out specifically, that the p-value is less than or the p-value is not less than. That is called the linkage between what we saw happen versus what is our standard um, of rejecting versus failing to reject. And so based on if we reject or fail to reject, then we are going to state that we either do, if we fail, or no, we do have enough evidence if we reject the null hypothesis, versus we would say we do not have enough evidence if we fail to reject the null hypothesis. So either we do or do not have enough evidence that the alpha equals whatever that alpha level is, typically 5%, to conclude and then we're always trying to conclude the alternate hypothesis, always the alternate we are trying to conclude here in the end. So what does that look like for our Oreo problem? Well, you tell me, because this is the you do. Tell me how that p-value compares to our alpha. What is going to be your decision? Are you going to reject or fail to reject? And then tell me, do you or do you not have enough evidence at the whatever alpha level to conclude that the mean weight of an Oreo is what exactly to 11.3 grams. So again, make sure that your conclusion is ultimately about the alternate hypothesis. And we will discuss this the next day in class.